Okay, we're gonna tackle a bit of a complex subject here. Carpal instability. Lots of stuff, we're gonna to try to unpack it all. There's four major types of things that fall into the category of carpal instability. The first is abbreviated CID, carpal instability dissociative. CIND, carpal instability non-dissociative. CIC, carpal instability complex. And CIA, carpal, carpal instability adaptive. The first one we're gonna do, we're gonna knock some of these out of the way and then we'll tackle the harder ones in a little bit. CID is carpal instability dissociative. So that's when the bones within the row, typically we're talking about the proximal row, the bones within that row lose congruity, congruity and stability. That's when we end up with visi or dissi, volar intercalated segmental instability or dorsal intercalated segmental instability. That's when we have lunate collapse volarly for volar or dorsally with dorsal, when we lose lunotriquetral or scapho -lig uh, scapholunate ligament integrity, whether it's an attenuation or a rupture. We've got some other courses on that. We've got some other short courses and things, so we're not gonna get super deep into that one, but know that that's when you have instability within the proximal row, okay? Then we have carpal instability non-dissociative when the whole proximal row moves volarly or dorsally, it subluxes based on ligament stability on the whole volar um, carpal ligament complex or dorsal carpal ligament complex. So this is the whole row. It's non-dissociated because that dissociation refers to the bones within the row. So the whole row is unstable. Loss of the volar intercarpal ligaments causes a clunk during collapse of the proximal row into extension at the end of ulnar deviation. So when I go into ulnar deviation at the end of that range, the volar ligaments aren't able to hold the volar row where it's supposed to be, the proximal row where it's supposed to be, so they clunk into extension, they drop back. Loss of the dorsal intercarpal ligaments causes the dorsal row to clunk as the proximal row extends without the support of the distal row. So when I'm moving through that same range of motion, the distal row clunks because of all the loss of that stability. So the proximal row um, is moving into extension and the distal row clunks as it goes through that range of motion. We're gonna get back to CIND. That's the one where we're gonna hang out with on, on this one. Carpal instability complex is when you have both CID and CIND put together, okay? It's complex, it's both of them put together. So if you understand the two, you understand CIC. Carpal instability adaptive is instability of the carpal row due to external forces. So if I have a distal radius fracture and maybe it's non-operative and that patient heals out of alignment and I have a malunion of that radius and that volar degree of, uh, excuse me, the volar tilt degree is greater than 12 degrees, that's gonna have this domino effect and cause carpal instability down the line. So it's not an inherent intrinsic problem within the carpal row, it's something proximal that causes that downline. That external force may be muscle dysfunction or tendon issues, but it's external, not intrinsic within the carpal row. So let's go back to CIND, carpal instability non-dissociative. This is movement between the rows becomes unstable. So the whole rows stay intact. The movement between the rows are super complex. And we're gonna show you some charts and things to kind of help it make sense. But in general, I'm gonna boil it down to some basic concepts and principles that you can then apply and kind of intuit the rest of it. The movements of the scaphoid are key in understanding what the proximal row does. So think about the dart thrower's motion. If I go through a dart thrower's motion, motion with wrist flexion and alder deviation, the wrist um, mechanics there, the scaphoid during flexion, the scaphoid goes into flexion. If I go into radial deviation, the scaphoid also goes into flexion. That's why we pair flexion and ulnar deviation on dart throwers, so the scaphoid doesn't go anywhere. But flexion and radial deviation result in scaphoid flexion. Extension and ulnar deviation result in scaphoid extension, okay? That's within the carpal row itself. 
The proximal row, though, follows the general patterns of the scaphoid. So I know the triquetra moves subtly different, but when you've got the scaphoid pulling that lunate with it, while the triquetrum does trend that direction, it's still moving holistically in the same pattern as the scaphoid. So when the wrist goes into flexion or radial deviation, as the scaphoid and lunate flex, so does the whole proximal row. When I go into radial deviation, whole proximal row flexes. Extension, scaphoid extends, so does the whole proximal row. The distal row does the exact opposite of whatever the proximal row is doing. Okay, So if the scaphoid and therefore the proximal row are flexing, the distal row is extending. It's an exact opposite correlation. Okay, So whatever the scaphoid is doing, the proximal row is doing. And the distal row is doing the opposite. So we've got this chart here. The simple movement of the wrist, flexion, extension, radial, and ulnar deviation. On the far right, you see simple motion. That's what we're going to see. When the wrist goes into flexion, the proximal row goes into flexion. But the distal row, we talked about it always doing the opposite, that common movement, we're going to see the distal row go into flexion because the gross movement we're seeing is flexion. You go to extension, what does the scaphoid do? It extends, so therefore so does the proximal row. But the gross movement is extension, so we're going to see it go into extension. But now if I look at the ulnar and radial deviation, when the wrist goes into flexion, what does the scaphoid pair together, flexion and radial deviation? So if the proximal row follows the scaphoid, when I come forwards into flexion, the scaphoid and proximal row flex and radially deviate. What does the distal row do? The opposite. We know it's got to flex because that's what the whole wrist is doing, but it's going to do ulnar deviation. So the gross movement across the board is flexion, but those subtle other things, the distal row is oppositional to the proximal row. So again, if I look at, let's say, radial deviation, if I go into radial deviation, what does the scaphoid pair with radial deviation? Flexion. It flexes. What does the distal row do for the non-primary movement of radial deviation? It extends. It comes backwards. It's going to radially deviate because the whole wrist is going that direction. But it opposes those secondary movements. It does the opposite. Okay. But we've got this pronation supination thing, right? That's this, this whole other complex movement we've got to figure out. And you can just memorize it, right? You can just stick it in your head and memorize it. And if you can do that, fantastic. I like to understand things at a little bit more base level so I can apply these concepts. I like to learn the concepts and apply it to the detail rather than just memorizing. But if you can memorize it, fantastic. Let's understand, super simple graphic here, why the proximal row and distal row have supination and pronation. The proximal row is primarily a spacer. It maintains the space in a uniform way between the distal end of the radius and the distal row. It maintains that space. So when I go into flexion and extension, for example, we'll keep it very simple there. When I go into flexion and extension, the lunate and the scaphoid are not symmetrical from an anterior to posterior perspective. The scaphoid we know is like a kidney bean shape. The lunate, kind of like a cashew, but it's smaller at one end than the other. So when I go into wrist extension, the lunate is at its thinnest gap between the radius and the distal row. When I go into flexion, it's at its greatest distance because it gets bigger. With the scaphoid, it's a little bit more dynamic. It's not as straightforward, but you can see that distance changes as it moves kind of in opposition of that, uh, that lunate. And that's what causes this rotational movement because one gets bigger and the other gets smaller. That's what we're looking at. Okay, so now we understand why it happens. Let's go back. The scaphoid is the key element for learning the movements of all of this, right? So we understand how it affects our understanding of gross flexion and extension and what those trends look like. The scaphoid also gives us a window into understanding pronation and supination, okay? So if we look at what happens during wrist flexion, that causes pronation of the scaphoid and the proximal row. That's what's supposed to happen. If I look at extension of the wrist, the scaphoid extends and supinates. 
understand that the distal row does the opposite. If the proximal row supinates, the distal row pronates. Exact opposite, okay? So, the proximal row really only has one direct musculotendinous uh, musculo connection, and that's the FCU as the pisiform is embedded in its tendon. Everything else means that all those tendons pass by without inserting the proximal row. So it's a passive subject in relation to the movement of external loads. So it does whatever the distal row, radius, metacarpals, it's passive in its response. The external forces pull on the members of the proximal row and have an impact on the tension and slack of the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligaments. So all of the external forces mean that the proximal row is a passive follower and there's dysfunction when the interconnections within that row fail, okay? So what external forces help or hinder the ligaments of that proximal carpal row? Let's look at those real quick. Okay, so I've got on here the representation of three different muscle groups. We've got ECRL, ECRB kind of works with it, but we call it ECRL. We've got uh, abductor pollicis longus, APL, and I've got flexor carpi ulnaris. Understand that this isn't exactly where the path goes, but it's the general direction. Obviously, it goes a little long here, but these are just the strips I cut. These muscles act to not just extend the wrist here and flex the wrist here, but they also have this oblique, mo uh, oblique moment arm where it causes this rotational movement as they contract, okay? that results in a rotational impact on the mid-carpal row. Understand that when we talk about carpal instability, when we use the term mid-carpal, it always refers to distal. We need to come up with a second name for it because everything has two names, but mid-carpal, think distal carpal row, okay? So when I have this extension of these muscles and contraction of this that flexes as well, that causes a rotational movement but these extensors have more load, more power than this one flexor because I really have two ECRL, ECRB plus one APL. So those act to extend. What that means is when I extend, it has a rotational supination impact on the wrist itself and therefore the distal carpal row. So when I activate those muscles, it causes supination, specifically also to the scaphoid. So these muscles, ECRL, ECRB, APL, and FCU have a rotational aspect and cause supination that also supinates the scaphoid. That means that the scaphoid is pulled into its destined position where it's supposed to be. So those muscles are friendly or helpful when reestablishing the scaphoid up against the lunate when you have some gapping and an SL injury. So the ECRL, the APL, and the FCU are SL friendly. Because they're SL friendly, that means they are lunotriquetral unfriendly, right? To keep it simple, we just mentioned the friendlies because you know if it's friendly to one, it's not friendly to the others. So when I do this movement and those muscles work and I try to fire those, it causes a light, light amount of, they're not primary supinators of the forearm, but they have a supinating impact secondarily. And so they cause the scaphoid to supinate to where it's supposed to be. If I have an SL injury, the scaphoid is not where it's supposed to be. I can use those to bring it into where it should be. Okay, so now let's talk about the other muscles. So now I have the other grouping of muscles. Again, these have kind of an oblique moment arm to them. So they kind of come in an oblique direction, right? So I have FCR, excuse me, I have FCR, flexor carpi radialis, and I have ECU, extensor carpi radialis. These muscles, when they contract, tre trend towards pronation of the forearm. Again, these are not primary movers. You wouldn't even see them on a list when you're looking at supination and pronation in a textbook or something like that. You wouldn't see those, but they have that impact because they pass by that, uh, that proximal and dorsal row, okay? So the ECU and the FCR have that pronating impact. And when the forearm pronates, it takes the scaphoid with it, 
and into pronation. But now we know that these are pulling on that triquetrum secondarily and approximating it up against the lunate because the triquetrum wants, wants to extend, right? That's its general pull. So the ECU and the FCR act as pronators, mid-carpal pronators. Now, understand that the FCR has kind of a unique thing here because it passes directly over the scaphoid. And because of that, when the scaphoid begins to flex because I'm doing this pronation movement, it's blocked by the tension of that FCR tendon. So it can't totally go into pronation the way it maybe otherwise would. So it initiates that movement, but the ECU is the primary muscle that's going to have impact on LT approximation and bringing those two together, making it friendly to those. So when we look at this expanded chart, you can see here that we have the midcarpal supinators are also SL friendly. The midcarpal pronators are LT friendly. What I didn't do is add on the redundant row that says if it's friendly to one, it's unfriendly to the other, but you can kind of infer that out from here, okay? So the friendly muscles correct the dysfunctional movement of the scaphoid or triquetrum if it is friendly to those, okay? So a little recap here, tons of stuff. Main issues, CIND, carpal instability non-dissociative is instability between the two rows when things aren't moving the way they're supposed to. Carpal instability dissociative is instability within the row, almost exclusively proximal row. That's SL and LT, visi and disi. The proximal row, when we're talking about CIND, the proximal row follows the movement patterns of the scaphoid. So if you're just not sure and someone asks, hey, when the wrist flexes, what does the proximal row do? It does what the scaphoid does. I know it flexes. If they go radial deviation, I know the scaphoid also flexes there. What does it hap What happens with rotation with forearm supination pronation? Well, I need to look at the line of those oblique muscles and say, if I'm flexing, then I'm also going into pronation of the scaphoid. If I'm extending, those muscles pull, and it does supination. And it's kind of a natural movement arm, like that dart throw is functional movement. So you can kind of just do that. What is the, What would the scaphoid be doing? In extension, it's kind of pulling into a supination moment arm here. So the proximal row follows the scaphoid. The distal row does the exact opposite. Don't even have to memorize that one. If you know the scaphoid, you know the proximal row, and you can infer the distal row. But understand that if the general gross movement is flexion, that's what the distal row is doing. It's not extending backwards. So whatever the gross movement is, the distal row is staying true to that. But those secondary movements are opposite. Scaphoid flexion is proximal row pronation, and scaphoid extension is supination, okay? And know the mid-carpal supinators and pronators, right? We've got the, um, the pronators and supinators that are these oblique lines of pull. Know those, and that'll help you understand which ones are SL-friendly and which ones are LT-friendly. So ECU and FCR are pronators of that carpal row, so they are friendly to the LT because it pulls that triquetrum up against the lunate. The other muscles that we had on earlier, the ECRL, APL, and FCU, those are supinators. And so those are friendly to the scaphoid because they pull that scaphoid up against the lunate on that side. If it's friendly to one, it's unfriendly to the other. So for treatment, if you've got a patient with that LT instability or an SL instability, activate the muscles that are friendly to that and avoid the muscles that are unfriendly. Isometrics work great. You can do isolated, um, uh, small isotonics if you want. You can do some light eccentric, but try to get those muscles firing that we know will help approximate the SL or the LT. But also know that the CIND is what the whole row is doing and understanding all of these massive complicated concepts. Lots of stuff here. Feel free to go back and pause on some of those charts, see what they look like, get a better understanding. Hopefully this helped.